So, uh, it is really my privilege to open this lecture on cancer registration in Europe today and to welcome you all here in person. Uh, for the, since quite a while ago, to do a lecture in person and also some people uh, online. Uh, so in general, cancer registry plays a crucial role in uh, the fight against cancer. And we have today the chance uh, to highlight this, thanks to this lecture. Um, the lecture will guide you through a general overview, uh, an overview about um, a bit of situation in Europe, and then zoom in into uh, the Netherlands with examples of how cancer registry can be used, and also some examples how it is used in, uh, in research. And we end up with a question-answer session, and also with a brief uh, networking upgable. So my name is Claudine Bacchus. For those who don't know me, I'm scientific director of the Luxembourg Cancer Registry and Epidemiology, epidemiologist here at the Luxembourg Institute of Health. And I have uh, really the privilege and I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Otto Risser here in Luxembourg in person. Uh, Dr. Uh, Risser is the director of the Netherlands Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Organization uh, ICANEL, uh, where he's responsible for the Netherlands Cancer Registry and um, also the Trial Data Management Department. And the Netherlands Cancer Registry is really seen as one of the best cancer registries worldwide, so we say comprehensive population-based cancer registries. Uh, Dr. Rieser graduated from medical school in the 80s and worked also for more than 20 years in the Comprehensive Cancer Center of Amsterdam and also was conducting the Amsterdam Cancer Registry since 1996. Uh, he has an extensive expertise in um, all the aspects of cancer registry, not only of the use of cancer registry, but the entire process, how you collect uh, the data. And he's involved in a large number of uh, epidemiological and also clinical uh, studies. On the top of this, Dr. Risser is uh, co-chair of the European Network of Cancer Registries. So this is with the joint support of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, this network's focus in general of the use and quality and comparability between the European countries. And um, I found also that you are a member of the scientific committee of the PAGIA, so the Pathological, Anatomical, National and Automated Archive, which is founded already in the 70s by the pathologist. And they provide support to pathologists to best use their uh, reports and also have to diagnose and contribute to treatment. And very recently, he kindly accepted to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Luxembourg's recently initiated National Center of Transnational Cancer Research. So I'm very grateful, Otto, that you are here in person. Thank you for all your support, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Claudine, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to start with there is something about the work, the organization that uh, I work. I work at ICANEL. You can see it at the, the right top of the slide. It stands for Internal Cancer Center Nederland. In English, mostly we say Comprehensive Cancer Organization. So, cancer registration in the Netherlands is organized not as a separate entity, but as a part of a larger organization. Um, the aim of ICANEL is to um, improve. Uh, oncological and palliative care for cancer patients, and we do that by using data. So uh, the data of our cancer registry are the, are the basis of everything we do. So we collect data, do research with them, and um, well, uh, write scientific papers and also share the results uh, with clinicians, because that's what it's all about. And they, because they treat the cancer patients, we do not have direct contact with the cancer patients that the clinicians have, so with our information, they can improve cancer care. Uh, ICANEL is organized, organized in three departments, so there's the registration department, of which I am the director, we have the department of research and development, uh, so they do the, do the research with the data, um, develop new techniques um, uh, for research, etc. Uh, they also build our database and, and, and um, uh, support us in importing uh, electronic data, etc. And then the third department is involved in sharing the data with the clinics. So uh, we support clinical networks also in the Netherlands uh, because many patients in the Netherlands are now treated not in one hospital but in a network of hospitals. 
where a part of the diagnosis and the treatment is being done in one hospital and another part may be done elsewhere. So we, we uh, as you can now stimulate the hospitals to form such networks uh, in order to, uh, to improve uh, cancer care, care in the end. Um, so going back to cancer registration, um, cancer registration already is very old in, in Europe. Uh, even outside Europe, there were already cancer registries before the Second World War in this slide, well, which is not very well seen for you, but um, Different uh, you can see that, let's say, in, uh, in Denmark and in Hamburg and in Slovenia, there was already cancer registration in 1950. In 1970, there were quite a lot more. So let me move on. Well, you can see that in the 1970s there were already cancer registration in all the Nordic countries and also uh, in, in other parts of, uh, of Europe. Uh, in 1990, you can see that also the Netherlands is, uh, is green. So our national cancer registry uh, was, uh, was, started, was starting in 1989. There were uh, some regional registries before that already, but uh, we were national since 1989. And you can see that also there are now evolving a number of regional registries in France, in Switzerland, in Italy, and also in Spain. And those numbers are increasing all the time. So 2017, which was the latest figure that we made, uh, there are cancer registries in almost all uh, European countries. Um, though not national in, in the largest countries. So in all the, 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 the large countries such as France, Spain, Italy and also Germany, there are only regional cancer registries. The smaller countries mostly have uh, national ones. Uh, in my country, uh, we also started with, with regional cancer registries. So I started at the Amsterdam Cancer Registry. Uh, but in uh, 2008, we merged all the regional databases together, and also in 2014, the, the organizations of the cancer registry also merged. So we have now one, one, one organization in the Netherlands and one cancer registry. Um, also in England and in Portugal, they started their regional cancer registries, but they have national ones at this moment also. And some countries uh, have both, such as Poland. Um, in 2015, there was a data call for all the European Network Cancer Registry members. Um, you can see that a lot of countries submitted data that are the green ones. The, the orange one did not submit data. Uh, some of them uh, did not submit data because of privacy issues, such as in Sweden and Finland. And other, uh, also some other Cancer registry did not submit data because, because the data were not complete or um, other reasons. For, I, I see that also Luxembourg was orange at that time, so there were no data submitted. Um, in total, there are already 30, more than 30 million records in the European database, and um, uh, they are from uh, 30 countries and more than 130 cancer registries. Uh, on this slide, you can see all the, the individual cancer registries and for which period they submit the data. Uh, and you can see that countries like uh, uh, Estonia and also Denmark and a number of French registries and also some from Italy and Spain and Switzerland, they have very long-lasting data, so they, have, they, they span a period of more than 40 years, but there are also very recent registries which admitted only one a year. And there were also uh, European registries that have more data than they, than they submitted to the European data call. Um, in the end, it's, um, it should be that all these uh, data are being uh, entered in the European Cancer Information System that was developed by the European Commission. And there are five parts in the, in the European Cancer Information System. There's a part with historical data, so that's the, the information that was registered by the cancer registry. There's a specific part for childhood cancers. 
then uh, because the latest data call was from 2015 and uh, we wanted to show some more recent data, uh, uh, we made uh, estimates for, for the most recent year. Uh, we do, don't, do not do that for each year, but we do that every two years. So the latest estimates were, were for uh, 2020. That's at the uh, bottom, the top uh, left. And uh, at this moment, the, the uh, incidents uh, and mortality estimates for 2022, 2022 are being prepared, so they will be in the database later this year. Uh, then there's also a section of predictions. And at the top of uh, top right, you can see that there are survival estimates. So um, it's quite a comprehensive database. Can I ask a question? Yeah, you, you can ask questions uh, between if you like. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so if not all the countries are submitting data, how, how are the estimations then being done? Is this taken into account still all the countries to get in, or is it done per country? It is done, it's being done per country, and it depends on the available data, how they make the estimates. So ah, let's say, let's take the Netherlands. So for the Netherlands, you, there are available data up to 2014, and then they make predictions for the year 2020 or 2022 using the available data. That, that now, that they have now at the ECHIS database, which is until 2014. Mm -hmm. In our own registry, we, have, we already have data of 2021, but they do not use that. Uh, for countries with regional data, they, uh, they have designed mechanisms to combine the regional data and uh, make, make a, a national estimate based on that. And then again, they make a prediction for the most recent year. And for countries that they do not have data, they use data from other countries and the mortality statistics. So, because for all countries there are mortality statistics, also for Luxembourg, um, well, they assume that survival is more or less the same in Luxembourg as it is, for example, in Belgium, France, and Germany. So using the mortality statistics uh, from Luxembourg and the survival in the other countries, you can make a prediction of the incidents in Luxembourg. So that's how it works. Can I also ask, so uh, the data which is shared with the European Cancer Information System, is this aggregated data or do you basically... It's on it's, it's it's a record data. level, but I, I'm, okay. I will talk about that. Uh, because we have now the GDPR, it, the, the, um, we, we plan to do a submission every five years. So uh, the last data call was in 2015, so it should, be, it should have been 2020. Um, but, well, in the meantime, the GDPR uh, came, so um, the lawyers at, at, at JRC, because we work with JRC, which, part, which is the scientific uh, body for the European Commission, and um, well, the lawyers, they, they thought it would be best to make a collaboration agreement between JRC, which is the holder of the database, and the individual re registries, where well, it took more than I think two or three years to make such a collaboration agreement. And well, it has now been distributed to all, to all the registries for, for signature. And I think that we are now more or less halfway. So half of the registries has now signed the collaboration agreement. And um, based on that collaboration agreement, they can submit individual data. So at record level. Still, there are cancer registries that say that they do not want to submit data on a, on a record level and they are allowed to send aggregated data. But we prefer record level data because um, well, it makes you much, much more flexible and also you can do all kinds of quality controls that are not possible when you only have aggregated data. So we prefer record level data. Um, we also made a new data protocol for which items should be submitted. It was a little bit different from the previous one. We deleted the, uh, uh, some items and uh, we also added some items. One of the items that was added is uh, um, an item on the geography, so the, where the patient lives. We used the nudge levels from the European Union. 
so that we can make the cancer atlas hopefully in the future. Uh, well, the database is open for sub submission since last week, so every registry can now submit data after they have signed the collaboration agreement, although it's not, for JRC, it's not a uh, prerequisite to sign the, uh, the collaboration agreement. Uh, registries are still free to send data, submit data without signing the collaboration agreement, but that's up to them. I hope that the first results will be there at the end of this year, and then that the database will be updated with the most recent data. And in future, the data can be submitted anytime, any day, so there will not be a specific data call in future anymore. The collaboration agreement does not have an ending date, so it's, it's forever, let's say, uh, until, until it will be replaced with something else. And uh, ECHS database will, will be updated twice a year. So let's say if you submit data in, uh, in June and the next update is in, uh, in October, then uh, this, the data that you sent in in June will be in ECHS in October. So would, that's the way it will work. So no more specific data calls. And each time you are supposed to send all your data. So that the old data will be thrown away and be replaced with, with the new data. Um, something about legislation and funding. Well, I already mentioned the collaboration agreement. Um, of course, that's something has something to do with the data submission. But uh, the basis of the, the fact that you uh, collect data uh, is mostly on, in, the board, in some form of legislation in, the, in most countries. The Netherlands are an exception. We do not have legislation yet. I hope it will come in the future. Uh, we asked the minister to arrange that. It's, it will probably take years. So that's the kind of thing normally works. Um, the basis of our cancer registry is that we have contracts, as we can now, with all the individual uh, hospitals in which we uh, agree that our co-workers collect data from cancer patients in the specific hospitals and these data are being entered in our database. Um, informed consent is not necessary according to our legislation, uh, also not according to the GDPR, um, but um, patients have to be informed that they are being registered. Being registered uh, that's something uh, also arranged in the contract. So in the contract it says that the canal and the hospital will inform the cancer patients by leaflets and so on. Uh, and there's an opt-out for cancer patients. So if they do not want to be in the registry, they can um, make that known to us. Um, although many cancer registries have legislation and the Netherlands not, there is not a direct relation to the quality of your data and the legislation. Well, we have a fine registry in the Netherlands without uh, legislation. Many countries in Europe have, do have legislation, but their registration is not so good. So it's not a guarantee that you have legislation. But sometimes it makes things more easy when there is legislation. Um, funding is a problem for many cancer registries uh, in Europe. Mostly it's by regional or national health authorities. So I mention also region because there are many regional cancer registries, especially in, in the south of Europe, and especially those registries which are very small, uh, sometimes covering only 100,000 inhabitants or something like that. Uh, uh, well, and they are dependent on uh, a regional health authority which does not have any money at all. So they have really problems uh, to maintain their, their status. Um, in the Netherlands, we are funded by the, the Ministry of Health. So um, we are in a part of the, uh, let's say, um, the budget of the Ministry of Health that is being revived. Every five years, we were that part was revised uh, two years ago. So we have still, still three years that we are certain of our budget. 
And well, uh, after the new, new budget uh, round is uh, in place, it's possible that we get less money or, or more money. That, that's uncertain. So uh, you never know. Um, there are all kinds of different cancer registry. You can have a cancer registry in hospital, so that's a hospital-based cancer registry. But in fact, I am talking about population-based cancer registries. And the population-based cancer registry <coughs> is a cancer registry that covers uh, a whole area. So all the residents in that area. And that's about, let's say, the legal population in that area. And in a population-based cancer registry, each case should be registered that is incident to a legal residence of that area. So that's the, the general idea of population-based cancer registries in Europe. And that means that prevalence cases in immigrants or uh, incident case, cases in non-residents do not have to be registered. You are free to do so, but they do not count for the incidents in that in your registry. So of course you can collect data about these patients, but they are not relevant for the incidents. And the other way around, when you have incidence cases in residents from Luxembourg, for example, with the diagnosis and or treatment outside the area, so outside Luxembourg, they should be registered. Well, that's a, that may be a little bit different. Where the diagnosis is in Luxembourg and the treatment is uh, elsewhere, well, it should be feasible to register that patient, at least, as, let's say, for the diagnosis. Uh, the treatment can then be elsewhere. Uh, but when also the diagnosis is elsewhere, it may be very hard to catch such a patient. But in fact, it should be in the, it should be in the cancer registry. If it's not, you are, you are incomplete. And given the nature of Luxembourg, with many well um, residents being treated abroad, it can be a reason for a high level of incompleteness. I, I, I do not have information about that, but there is a risk for that. Even in the Netherlands, we have the, this kind of problem in uh, South Flanders, which is close uh, next to Belgium. Many patients go to Belgium for treatment, and when you look at, uh, at, at the map of cancer incidents in the Netherlands, cancer incidents in South Vlaanderen is a little bit lower than in the rest of the country. Um, well, how to achieve completeness? Because if you are not complete, you can't do very much with your data. Uh, of course, um, it depends on what you want to do with it. You can also do research with 50% uh, of all the cases, as long as they are um, not biased. So if you have a good selection of patients and you only have half of them, you can do quite a good uh, study with that. But um, when there's bias in your data, you cannot use it. So, completeness is really essential, and many cancer reg the reg the registries in Europe, also in uh, high-level uh, uh, countries, uh, they, have sometimes, they have, can have problems in reaching completeness. Uh, well, first of all, you have to no use multiple sources of uh, notification, uh, and most countries have uh, notifications from pathology lab laboratories, from hospital registries, and from the cause of death registry. So uh, often they receive all the death certificates. And of course, um, it's very difficult to, to reach 100% completeness. So some uh, incompleteness is accept acceptable, but it should not exceed more than 5% or so. Um, the problem is to ascertain the level of completeness, because if you don't know the real incidence, you cannot also determine how complete or incomplete you are. You can. Uh, of course, there are, of course, methods to, to, um, to make an estimate of the completeness, for example, by looking at the number of deaths. Right? Because uh, well, if you know the number of deaths and you know the survival rate, then you can also calculate, uh, make an estimate of the incidence that you expect and compare that with the real incidence that you have to collect. I can tell you how we, we have the notification in the Netherlands. 
uh, well, we use the pathology lab laboratories and about 90% of all the cases are being notified by the pathology labor laboratories in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Claudine mentioned already in, in your introduction, I'm also involved in PALGA. PALGA is a network of the pathology laboratories in the Netherlands. Uh, it was founded 50 years ago already. And via that network, um, the pathology laboratories share their results. And uh, using that network, we also receive notifications. So each cancer case that has been diagnosed in a pathology laboratory, um, if that's the case, then uh, we receive a message of that cancer case overnight. So the case that was diagnosed yesterday, we received today. Um, that's on a daily basis and it's completely automatic. That it only uh, is, let's say, the basic information of pathology. So it's, it's the site, the morphology. Um, it, has, it has a date, but it's not the incidence date. And sometimes it also has some information about the surgery that's being done, but it mostly said it's a biopsy or a surgery or something like that. We do not get, let's say, stage data from it. It's only the basic information. Then the second source is, um, and in the Netherlands it's called LBZ, that's net natural registration from hospitals. So every patient that enters a hospital, either at the outplin clinic or uh, uh, in the hospital itself, is being coded, and we get about 10% of all our cases from the LBZ. Um, of course, uh, uh, almost all the, uh, the patholo pathological confirmed cases are also notified by LBZ, but let's say 10% of all the cases are only notified by LBZ. Um, that's much higher for a number of can cancers, in fact it's about 15% for lung cancer, because not, that's the proportion of lung cancers that does not have pathology, and it's even 30-40% to 40 for pancreatic or liver cancer, and more than 50% for tumors of the central nervous system. Um, well, while we receive the pathology data on a daily basis, LBZ data we receive only a few times a year, at uh, this moment mostly twice a year, um, because well, that, that process from, from LBZ is not fully automated yet, let's that, that say there's no way that yet that we receive it uh, completely automatically. Then the third source that's being used by most cancer registry, that's the cancer death registry, that's not available in the Netherlands because of legislation. We can link with the cause of death registry, but not receive data on an individual level. So Sweden and the Netherlands are the only countries in, the Netherlands, in Europe that cannot use the cost of death registries. Of course, we do have mortality statistics, but they are being independently calculated by the statistical office in the, in the Netherlands. Because the death certificates are very important for many cancer registries, I want to, sh um, to show you what you can do with it. Um, following the notification for on the death certificates, if that uh, case is not yet in the cancer registry, uh, a cancer registry will try to trace back such a case. So uh, I'm not really, it depends on the country how they do that, and I as we do not have death certificates uh, available in the Netherlands, I'm not sure how they do it exactly, but mostly they have an indication of the hospital where that patient uh, can have been diagnosed, so they go to that hospital and look for that case. If they can find it, they, it's being called a death certificate initiated case, and it's being registered just in, in a normal way, as, as they always do. If they cannot find uh, the patient in the hospital, then it's still included in the cancer registry, but then it's called a death certificate only patient. Um, and a registry that has a high proportion of death certificate only patients, uh, well, that probably is incomplete for, uh, for non-lethal cancers. So, for example, for breast cancer. So, 
as most people of, um, with a lung cancer die from lung cancer, well, with death certificates, you're, you're almost complete for lung cancer. But as many patients with breast cancer luckily do not die from breast cancer, if you are, you know, you, if you never receive a death certificate with, with, with breast cancer, then, then you miss the, the ones that, that do not die from breast, breast cancer. And well, there are registries that have, let's say, proportions of BCOs of 10% of even high, or even higher, and that's really too high. So, what should you collect in a cancer registry? Well, um, there are no official rules for it. There are some recommendations. Um, the items that are on this uh, slide show the minimal data set that was uh, many years ago uh, drawn up by the WHO, in fact, drawn by uh, an organization in WHO, IR. And it includes a personal identifier, preferably a health insurance number or a social security number, depending on where you are, in which country. You should register the sex and date of birth. Also, ethnicity is in this list, but there's no one, not one registry of which I know that they collected in, in, in Europe. Uh, in my country, we collect the country of birth, and that can be used in analysis because that's also in our population register, so we can link with them, so that's why we have the country of birth. You should always collect the date and the base of the diagnosis, and the date of diagnosis we call incidence date. The type of cancer by, uh, by registering topography, the morphology, and also the grade. Uh, well, we, I don't know, I don't, do the people here all know what ICDO is? Or? I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, um, the WHO, uh, a very long time ago, developed a system for the classification of diseases, which is called the ICD, so International Classification of Diseases. Um, well, they changed that system every 10 or 20 years or so. Um, and when the cancer registry started, uh, they started collecting uh, cancer with the ICD system. Uh, so, and there's a code for, for example, breast cancer in ICD, and there's also a code for prostate cancer, etc. Uh, but when you register, um, for example, a hematological malignancy or so, or so, then, well, it's not a site that's really important, but it's more the morphology. So, uh, at that time, when cancer registration became, became more common, they thought, well, we have to have a separate classification for oncology, so they, 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 they developed uh, an international classification of diseases for oncology, so that's ICD-0. Um, but as the ICD changes all the time, so the first edition of ICD-0 was made when ICD-9 was the most current uh, version of ICD. After that there came ICD-10, so developed ICD-0. Two. Later on, they made an update of ICDO2, so that's, we have now ICDO3. But in the meantime, we are now uh, in the, uh, the era of ICD11. So there will probably also be an update of ICDO. Um, and, but there's one aspect ICD11 is now more uh, comprehensive than all its predecessor. This probably it will not be necessary to have a, a separate specification for, for cancer anymore. So I hope that we can move forward in, in the future also as cancer registry ICD-11, because in, uh, in death statistics they, are, they also always use ICD, so they use ICD-9 and ICD-10 and hopefully in the future ICD-11. The cancer registries use ICDO, so it's always difficult to compare Incidence and mortality data, and also the most uh, also in hospitals they use ICD and not ICDO. So I hope that in future the difference between ICDO and ICD will completely disappear and that you all move to ICD eleven. Well, we will see. Um, you also need uh, need the data of follow in or in the vital studies. If you have this, you can participate in, in international data calls from IARC. 
and uh, you can uh, also participate in data calls from the European Net. So, and with these items, I will show you later in my talk, you can do already quite a lot. So, if you have this and your, your quality is good, then you have made your first step. So, and it's better to have only a few items that are good than many items that are not good. So, focus, make focus, that's better than try to collect everything and then sometimes you have nothing in the end. Um, as a next step, you can collect additional items. And then the first one that are relevant, first ones that are relevant are stage and treatment. So the ENCR has uh, also recommendations. There will be an update uh, later this year of what kinds of registers we should, should collect. That also, of course, uh, contains what was in the previous slide, but it, it also contains what is in this slide. But nevertheless, if you are, if you have limited resources or the information uh, is not available, well, then you can leave this out and focus on the on the data from the first slide. But of course, it's very relevant to have this information. So everyone uh, wants to know what is the stage of the tumor and how what was it treated, especially what, when you want to, want to have more impact for clinicians. Uh, we have always in the Netherlands start uh, collected these items from the beginning for all kinds of cases. So we have now over 30 years of uh, TNM items for all kinds of patients. As far as it's relevant, You may try to collect any other item, whatever you like. And of course, there are, I, I just mentioned some in this, in this slide. It can be anything. For example, uh, the performance status of the patient, whether there's comorbidity, comorbidity you can uh, collect information about diagnostic procedures, or imaging, or is the cancer screening related. You can collect additional information about the tumor. Um, are there cytogenetic aberrations? Or is R2 positive in breast cancer or in stomach cancer or whatever? You can collect all kinds of details on treatment. Uh, so we recommend at least to collect data about the first treatment line, line. mostly call it primary treatment, but of course it may be also relevant to uh, collect data about second and sub subsequent lines of treatment. As many, for example, many, many new drugs that, that are now being uh, uh, used in, in, in the treatment are, are only given in second or third lines because they first try, let's say, the traditional chemotherapy, if that's not relevant, and if that does not help, then they, they try another one. You can also collect the number of cycles, the dose, or at adverse events. It's, of course, also relevant to collect data about uh, recurrence or progression, and also for referrals. Yes? Um, is that data computer readable, or does it need to be interpreted when it is accessed? In my registry, we still collect it by hand. Uh, of course, uh, we try. I, I will finish with, 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 the, with the future, but it's still difficult. Yes. Uh, today, how much uh, items do you have uh, in the in your cancer registry? Well, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, not, be honest, really. Because it also depends on how you count. We have very many items, but uh, let's say there are items that you only collect for one type of tumor. So, uh, and how do you count? We sometimes uh, collect cytogenetic aberrations. Well, how do you count that? There can be, uh, let's say, five different cytogenetic aberrations in one patient. Is it five items or is it only one? Or I don't know. So we, we collect all, all, almost all of them that are on the slide, and even much more. But not for all cancers. Not also, also not for all, all patients with a certain diagnosis. Sometimes we do it for a certain period or uh, towards some hospitals or because we have additional funding, we collect, for example, recurrence. You do not have to do it all for, for all cancer patients. You, you should focus.
And on the treatment side, uh, you capture like medication and um, dosages, right? From dosage we do, do only very rarely, only for a few drugs we do that. And also like surgeries? Uh, yeah, we do the type of surgery, mostly whether it's, let's say, is, is it an organ sparing surgery or is it uh, a surgery that removes the whole organ? And uh, well, it depends a little bit on the type of cancer. Do you also use uh, terminologies to encode the medication, for example, like a Medelar catalog or? For, for the drugs, we use uh, APC codes. Do you know that, what, what that is? ATC? Yes. Uh -huh. And but there are no, let's say, um, that the problem with ATC codes is that, that there is a code for each drug. But many drugs are being given in a combination, of course, in a, sch in a, in a scheme. So we mostly collect the scheme and not, the, let's say, when you have a scheme with four drugs, we collect the scheme and not the four drugs. So, and as there is no code for the scheme, we collect, we have our own codes. Let's say when you have, uh, uh, well, uh, lymphoma that's been treated with CHOP or R-CHOP, then we collect the R, we took him up, and we have a code for CHOP. So we have two codes for one treatment. But in fact, it's five different CHOP drugs. It's a little bit too complicated to collect it all. But sometimes we do it for when we have a project or something like that, for a small series of patients. Um, well, of course, your, for the, the vital status was in, in, the, in the list of the WHO. Um, it depends a little bit what are the possibilities uh, for uh, the achieving the right vital status. In the Netherlands, we can link with the population registers. That means we receive once a year um, um, uh, all the patients that died in the preceding year and all the persons that left the country. So we, re so we also have information about emigration because if the patient had left the country and dies elsewhere you should know you probably will not receive that information from that other country um, so then you censor that patient at the date of emigration especially for Luxembourg I think it's very relevant to have information for emigrants so everyone who has left the country should be censored at the, at the date of emigration. And if you have that information, you can calculate uh, the survival rate. As an example, I show here the survival of patients who were diagnosed with the multiple myeloma. Um, many survival curves are Kepler-Meyer uh, survival curves. This is not a Kepler-Meyer curve, so, so you should look at the different way. At the X-axis is the year of the diagnosis, and uh, you see three lines of the one-year survival, the five-year survival, and the ten-year survival. So what you can see is that uh, during the 1990s, one, five, and ten-year survival were rather stable for this disease. So one-year survival was around 75%, uh, five-year survival about 30%, and ten-year survival about 15%. Not much happened in that time, uh, but after the year 2000, uh, the treatment changed. New drugs in the treatment uh, for multiple myeloma became available, and you see that uh, one year survival is now approaching 90%. Uh, five year survival increased to almost 60%, and 10 year survival is also. So this is the result of the introduction of new drugs for multiple myeloma in the Netherlands. Yes. Um, if when you get the information from the population registry you mentioned, do, do they also give the, the reason of death? No, we do not get the cause of death. So you, you assume if someone had 
I mean, so how do you know if someone died from the disease? Now this is overall survival. Now this is relative survival. Um, you can calculate uh, different. I have the, I have a slide about that. Uh, I will see. I'll just okay. say that later. Yeah. But this is relative survival. So preferably you have uh, disease specific survival, but we cannot calculate it in the Netherlands because we don't have the cost of death. Um, for everything that we register, there are rules and recommendations, either from ICDO or from uh, uh, IARC. Uh, there are also a number of ENCR recommendations, and they can be very detailed. Um, and I just give you one example. Um, some items seem very uh, simple. Let's say the sex. Well, you have a code for a male and you have a code for a female. It may be a 1 and 2 or an M and F. It doesn't matter. That's simple. But uh, you also have to take into account how to deal with, for example, transsexuals. So we agreed in Europe that we code the sex at birth. So that someone who changed its sex from a male to a female still can be registered with the prostate cancer. So you have to think of everything. It's although it's very rare. Well, in the in the cancer registry, you also have to deal with rare thing, rare situations, and that's why you need the rules. Uh, of course, there are also rules and recommendations which tumors should be registered because not all the registry registers sell the same tumors. Well, at least you should all the uh, registry, of course, all the malignant tumors except basal cell and squamous cell cancer carcinoma of the skin. Um, preferably, you should also register non-invasive tumors, especially of the bladder and the breast. Um, you should also register benign and borderline malignant tumors of the central nervous system, and preferably also borderline epithelial tumor of the ovaries, ovaries. And then there are, of course, always optional tumors that you can re uh, register. Of course, it's optional to register basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. You can also register other non-invasive tumors, for example, the cervix or the esophagus or other borderline malignant tumors. But mostly these, those are not included in the, in the let's say, in the ECHS database, so we will not present international comparisons of that. Because, for example, uh, non-invasive tumors of the cervix, well, the definition changes all the time, and it also depends whether you have a screening program or not, so it's difficult to compare international data. Let's say the definition of uh, non-invasive breast cancer is more, more stable, so then you can compare uh, European data. Of course, you also want to have a high quality. Um, most registries have sub software that's been developed in their own registry to check their data, for example, that you do not uh, register prostate cancer in a female, or something like that, and there are many, many other examples. Uh, the joint research uh, research center in co collaboration with ENTR also has developed data quality check software, and that should be run before the submission. So, at least that the most obvious mistakes are already removed. Do you measure data quality in your register? Well, not in my own registry, but uh, we do it on a European level. Let's say after the data submission, all kinds of quality indicators are being calculated. And uh, when, well, when, the quality, when the quality indicators um, are not good enough, then the work data are not accepted. Um, especially if you change something over time, then it's relevant to monitor also your own quality. We are still doing a, a study now, and it's not complete yet, a study about completeness, because we linked our data with Statistics Netherlands for the, for the mortality statistics, because we do not get death certificates. We are still curious how many patients do we miss. Uh, well, it, it, it appears that we do miss patients, but that are also, also diagnosis 
that are not always um, correct in the death certificate. So sometimes a general practitioner says, well, it was probably lung cancer, well, or possibly lung cancer, well, we don't accept that for cancer. So we ask for certain uh, cancer types, our incidence is a little bit lower than the market statistics. Um, timeliness is also very important. So if you have very old data, well, no one is interested anymore. Um, that's not true, of course, but um, they should be complete uh, after, preferably after one year or something like that. And uh, most registries do not reach that goal. Um, so that is a bit of a problem. Uh, let's say when you only want to monitor cancer incidence, well, it's not so bad because incidence never changes from one year to another. Let's say never, I will show in a comment that's not true all either. But mostly it does not change from one year to another. So it grows, let's say, by a few percent per year or it's going down. Well, that is not interrupted mostly. So for incidence, it's not, it may not be a problem. Um, but um, when you want to have some impact on the clinicians also, and you have more detailed data, then the timeliness of your data is relevant. In the Netherlands, our data are also used for, uh, for quality uh, in clinical registries, um, for quality assurance, and uh, clinicians want to have fairly recent data. So that's for that's why breast cancer in the Netherlands is now being registered three months after the diagnosis. But, um, that's why we agreed that with, with the hospitals. Uh, to my opinion, three months is a little bit too early because uh, many treatments are not yet completed at that time. So in that case, we have to go to the medical file twice. And that's not very efficient. But let's say um, six, between six and nine months after di diagnosis, trying to complete a, a, regist a registration is, is the ideal situation. That's, uh, that's not easy. Um, well, just an example that sometimes it is relevant to have recent data. These are the data of uh, the year 2020 when COVID-19 uh, appeared. And you, as you can see, these are the, the number of cancer cases on a weekly basis in the Netherlands. And you can see that in, uh, let's say, the beginning of March, when the first COVID-19 patient was diagnosed, the number of diagnoses decreased 30 to 40 percent for, uh, for all cancer sites, excluding skin and skin cancer even dropped by 60 percent but as we receive the pathology notification on a daily basis we could calculate this very very soon already so we for a number of, uh, of weeks we monitored cancer incidents on a, on a weekly basis so we counted each week what were the number what were the numbers uh, the purple uh, weeks are the weeks with uh, holidays in the Netherlands. So in those weeks there were only four working days instead of five. So in the, those weeks the numbers are even lower than the other weeks. But uh, the general picture is at least, well, there was a, a huge decrease in the number of cancer cases that were diagnosed. And, but there was also a fast recovery that it took until, let's say, until the autumn, uh, when the let's say the normal level was uh, was again uh, there. Now this is an overall picture of the number of cases uh, that were diagnosed in 2020 in comparison to 2019. Um, these were all based on preliminary data, on the pathology data only. So, uh, in the end, we calculated slightly different uh, uh, percentages, but the general picture was the same. 
the overall incidence decrease in 2020 was 5%. So we had 5% less cancer cases in 2020 compared to 2019. For breast cancer, it was um, a, a reduction of 12%, mostly related to the, the temporary hold of the, the breast cancer screening. And also in colorectal cancer, you see a 9% decrease in all year. Uh, that was also because the, the colorectal cancer screening was so this was a situation that we really needed timely data. Uh, well, COVID-19 is now more or less normal. It's integrated in our health system. So um, we still have a, a, a new wave now in the Netherlands of COVID-19 cases, but it does not influence cancer incidence anymore. This is the same picture as you saw in the other one, but this is on a monthly basis. This is the 2020 line, so in April there was a reduction of about, let's say, the whole month of uh, about uh, 25%. But although we had many other waves, you don't see a, a reduction anymore. So uh, it's now more or less, or less the same level. So, uh, everyone has got used to it. Well, I had one slide about uh, the, the international collaborations. I already mentioned, of course, the European, European Network of Cancer Registries. I also already mentioned the JRC, so we work closely together, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. It's uh, located in ISPRA at the Lago Maggiore. Uh, I already also mentioned uh, the International Association of Cancer Registry, so that's the same as the ENCR, but that in, in, on an international scale. Uh, USAC is re responsible for the TNM classification. You have the WHO classification of tumors online of the IARC. That's, being, that's the basis of ICDO and all the updates. And uh, I also want to mention Eureka, that's a, a group from Italy uh, that uh, tries to calculate uh, survival in Europe and also publishes about that. And all kinds of other projects. Um, well, I already spoke about what you should collect. Well, in fact, you do not have to collect everything yourself, of, of course. You can also link your data to other uh, databases. Um, and I think that in the future, or, or maybe already now, um, linking is, is, let's say, that's the future. Um, but of course, you have to have other databases that you can link to. If there is nothing to link to, you cannot do it. So. Um, there have to be uh, all kinds of databases. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have, uh, I already mentioned Palga, and Palga also has, a, let's say, a large database with all the pathology diagnoses. So if we want to have detailed information from a pathology, we can link to the Palga database. Um, well, we have the, uh, the hospital discharge registry, the LBZ. It also contain, we, we, we use it as a notification source, but there are many, many uh, detailed data in LBZ that we can also link to. We have also databases with uh, uh, pharmacological data, pharma database, so that's what we link to also. And uh, there are all, all kinds of other perspectives, yes. Does it also link to biobanks in the Netherlands, like to the brain banks or to other biobanks? Well, so the there, are, there are biobanks, but that, those biobanks are more banks with, let's say, specimens, you, but not with the, data. You have to have data. Can the specimens be linked back? It's not the interest of um, the registry, but the interest of the biobank, for instance, to sort of get registry data. To well, the, the biobanks are mostly related to the pathology, mm -hmm. and we can link the pathology database to... Uh, to the cancer registry. Via pathology, okay. Yes. And we, there's not always a practical uh, way to, to link directly to, to a biobank because a biobank is, is not something, it's not data mostly. 
Yeah, it's via this, the patient or the individual case that where you have biopsy in a specimen, you may want to uh, see, like, the, the registry will keep looking after the progress in the disease and on the treatment scale. And maybe that is also interesting um, well, to have in mind when ordering specimens from a biobank to see what the patient... Yeah, when, when that's possible, but via, uh, not, not directly from the cancer. Yeah, okay. yeah. It has to go to the, uh, to the pathology. Um, well, how do you link data sets? Well, preferably using a health insurance number or a social security number. Uh, the Nordic countries you do that all the time, so they link, they have that number in the, the registry, and that number is also very many other registries, so can link, they can link everything. Um, in the Netherlands, that's not possible uh, yet, so we use in the Netherlands mostly probabilistic record linkage. We have the name in our registry, the date of birth, because we cannot use that number, uh, and we have an address. Um, postal code. Uh, so that's how we link the pathology database. Um, you can also do that via a trusted third party if, uh, if necessary. If you only have pseudonymized data, um, well then you can link databases if you pseudonymize the data sets in the same way. I don't know whether it is possible in your country, uh, but some perhaps probabilistic record linkage is still also a possibility because you have a diagnosis and perhaps a postal code or whatever. And also, so yes. I have just a question. There are always also collaborations or discussions to link registries to clinical trials because clinical trials have precise treatment data, but they lack of follow-up data because after the. Mm -hmm. Trial has been published, and with GDPR, this gets more and more complicated because in clinical trials, we are no longer allowed, for example, to um, collect the date of birth, but just the age and for frequent cancer. This will be complicated. Do you intend to collect? Uh, like, do you know if a patient in your registry nowadays? have participated in a clinical trial or not? For some cancers, we do collect that, but then only whether a patient is um, being treated in that trial and not. Uh, and sometimes when uh, we also collect the number of the patient in that trial. So that would be an alternative. If you do that, then you can link via the number. But that's not always possible. We only do that. We only do it. Uh, sometimes we do. But yeah, let's say what is what is allowed and what is not allowed is well, lawyers never agree. And it's different in every country. Yes. Although we all have the same GDPR, but of yeah, course, exactly. countries so, made their own legislation based on the GDPR, so there are, of course, let's say, uh, national legislation may be a little bit different from the GDPR. So, but, um, well, many lawyers say that this and that is not allowed because of that, but I mostly do not agree. <laughs> but you, you actually, you don't have Autonomized data because no. we really have we have full identifying, identifying information because we are the lawyers say in my country they say that we are not allowed our social security number well and well <laughs> then we do not use it and then we we register all the personal identifying information it's really stupid to my opinion but <laughs> And that's also where we get, let's say, the, the data from the population registers, that the people, people that died and uh, emigrated. We also get the full names. Because otherwise we cannot link. Now the GDPR is not valid for people that have died, but it is valid for emigrants. So that we receive that. Um, how much time do we have? 
Well, it's already over 12. Maybe we can wrap up and have some questions. Uh, yeah. Soon. Do you want to finish that slide? Or? Yeah, well, of course, there are many uses of cancer registry data. There are just, let's say, the key items are incidence, mortality, survival, and prevalence. And with that, you can evaluate, for example, your cancer plan. Because in the end, everyone wants to decrease mortality. Uh, well, if that's not possible, then it's also uh, look at survival, of course, and prevalence. Um, yeah, it might, might enter the registry, we try also to, to help evaluate the quality of care, but, but for that you have much more detail than that. I have some examples, but I will just skip that. <laughs> Perhaps I can say one thing about the future. Uh, I have one slide about that. It's, you never know on beforehand how long uh, it will take. Well, I hope that in future everything will be automatic, but um, we are not there, not there yet. Um, of course, when you want to optimize your registration process, you have to have databases that are already there, um, such as claims data or hospital discharge data or, or something like that. A problem may be that, let's say, when, pay, when data are being registered for a certain purpose, they are not always good enough for another purpose. So when the purpose of the registration is financial, it may not be good enough for, let's say, cancer registration. Uh, you can also use Clinical databases, if they are available in, in your, your country, in the Netherlands we have um, the pathology database, which has now also many categorized information, so we are using that more and more. Um, well, there are of course also artificial intelligence techniques for text mining, when there are, let's say, texts from a patient's file. Um, I think that in the end will, will help us. Um, but I don't know when and how. But even then, I think that in the end, a combination of electronic data databases that were already, uh, already available, text mining with artificial intelligence, and a validation by uh, a data manager will be, be necessary. But I think it will take some time. Well, thank you very much, Otto, for all your explanations and also this excellent presentation. And I think it's fine that we are a bit later because it took a lot of time to really comprehensively ask all well and reply to all your questions. But I would love also to take some questions in general from the floor to a bit discuss if we still have the time. And afterwards, we also plan to have a little a drink here. So if you want to discuss more in detail with Otto, he's still here during the whole lunch break. Uh, personally, I wanted to give a bit of an insight also on some uh, topics you mentioned. So I think in Luxembourg we are doing some things good. <laughs> so uh, compared to the situations, we include also non-residents. Uh, so we follow all the recommendations. Compared to uh, your country, we have best certificates, so what's great. What I see, we have a legislation which at the beginning everyone is happy about, but then we also realize that it is providing limits uh, to certain points. And I would love to a bit open up because I think it's quite clear use uh, one of the best uh, cancer registries also exactly in the timeliness uh, to really have very quick and what you mentioned, the one year uh, would be the goal. Uh, however, Luxembourg is really lacking a lot behind. Um, and with all your experience, and as you know that we are revising our strategy and seeing if we can reduce, for example, our variables, do you know why you are even better than Germany or better than Belgium? Do you have one uh, take-home messages for us that we should implement and eventually adopt in Luxembourg? Well, we have data managers. <laughs> <laughs> and they have access to the medical file. And they can collect everything. That's 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 the that's our main success. And they are working directly for the cancer registry. Yes. Yeah.
they are employed by ECANEL. Uh, and uh, well, before COVID-19, they had their working place in the hospital with full access to all the medical files. Now they can log in uh, from home yeah. or from the office. But they still have access to the medical file. So we have the notification from, from the pathology, which also includes, of course, the hospital where that notification comes from and the, the, the number that the patient has in the hospital. So using that, the, the data manager can, can just enter the medical file of that, the electronic file of that uh, cancer patient. Yes. And so he or she can complete the cancer registration. Yes, which is a huge difference compared to Luxembourg because we have our data collectors in the hospital and everyone is collecting the same thing and we need to consolidate. And of, of the, we educate our own uh, staff, of course, so yeah, and we have our own manuals so that everyone does the same and then we have our rules and regulations and uh, all kinds of check in our own database so everyone does the same and works with the same program so everything is. Uh, in our own hands. Yes, that's something we do, but we still need to do the consolidation yeah. internally. And of course, that also has disadvantages because, in fact, we still have not enough electronic data. But as the sources are not there yet, it's. Mm. I think it will stay stay for some time. Some other questions. Yes, so um, if I'm a researcher, uh, can I uh, get access to the uh, data of the registry to analyze them in some context? Yeah, you can do it. Data, data request. Mm -hmm. Do you also publish uh, all the data sets that you have, like not the actual data sets, but the metadata about it? So yes, we are now building up a, a, a catalog with all the, the data that we collect. There was one, there is already one for breast cancer, so it's all already on our website. And uh, for the other cancers, they will follow. And the data that you share remains identified, or is it pseudonymized? In our database, let's say, it's, let's say we have uh, a part that's for, for the data managers, that's with full identifying information, and we have part of the data which is in our data warehouse, that's without identifying. So the researchers do not get access to any of the identifiers and they can then not combine the database with any other no. data sets in this. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, so what is the situation in the hospitals with regard to electronic medical files? And you know, how easy is it? I mean, is it homogenized or do you really have different systems? And well, there are different suppliers, so um, um, most hospitals have uh, Epic or Chipsoft uh, that are suppliers of uh, EPD systems and uh, so they are dependent what that system offers. And, uh, you can also adapt those systems to your own need, but uh, that makes data even less comparable. So, uh, but all those these systems um, uh, do not have uh, many categorized information. So, if you want to have stage, so a TNM, there's not a screen that says it's T1. M0, M0. For some cancers, it's there, and in some hospitals, that um, there are also being there are forms being developed for certain cancers. For example, for head and neck cancers, there is now a form in, in, in some, that's being used in some hospitals. Um, but sometimes that form is there, but it's not used in clinical practice. It's not being used by the doctor. So and then it has to be filled in by someone else, by a nurse or something like that, and then when, when that nurse is on holiday and it doesn't happen, or uh, a lot of fields are, are being left blank, so then you can't use it at all. So sometimes, well, I think in future there will be 
let's say uh, forms that are being linked to the to the to the process that to the to the road, to the road that the patient moves through a hospital, and then you can register the information that's relevant at that moment, and then it's relevant for the clinician. But as soon as you have a form that's not relevant for the clinician, he or she will not fill it in. So it has to be really describing the process for the patient. And we are, well, I, I think that will, will take decades to develop. Food. Yeah, so that means the data managers do a lot of manual work. Yes. yes. Of course, all the, the information that we already uh, receive from the, the pathology, so that they do not have to enter the name and the birth date because we already have that. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, topography and morphology mostly have to be changed because after the initial uh, notification, there has been a revision or uh, a more precise diagnosis or whatever. So, and TNM is mostly not in, in the. In the notification so they have to go to TNM and the treatments etc. So thank you very much Otto, for your presentation to be here in person and uh, looking forward to have the, the networking up I hope. Many thanks. Okay.